Good evening folks and welcome to another live stream. I am here to provide you with the best free advice and tips on how to pass the test and achieve your driving goals for 2021-2022. So if you have any questions for me let me know in the comments section and as you'll see from the middle of the screen there I'd like you to share your experience of the application process and of doing the test if you have done the test so that I can hear about how you got on and so others can learn from your experience too. So let us know how you got on, uh, whether you passed or failed the test. And as I always say, there's no such thing as failure. You either succeed or you learn something. That's the way to look at it. Also in the comments section, you can let me know about the things you're most worried about, the aspects of the tests that cause you most concern, whether it's about the reversing or the theory or whatever. Wojciech, first in, fair play to you. I was thinking of you, Wojciech, because uh, I have some uh, stuff you might be interested in um, on future recommendations for the driving test as part of the government's road safety strategy. So, Dobra VHR to you, Wojciech. Costel Minune, hello to you. John Ryan as well, welcome back. Good to be back, John. I had to take a little break from the live streams, folks, because of house renovations and I ended up out in the holiday home in Curraclaw and very, very beautiful, fabulous beach where Saving Private Ryan was filmed, but the internet was not the best. So now I'm back in Wexford Town, back to my fibre broadband and uh, all good. So anyway, welcome everybody. I'll get to the comments uh, as we go along. Uh, as I said, let me know any questions, let me know your experience in the comments section. Uh, anyway, I want to get straight into some updates. Um, that, like I normally start with on the test, the theory test, whatever like that. So let's get on to some news and updates first of all. So regarding the theory test, from January, you if you have dyslexia, you will be allowed to have a reader in with you now when you're doing your theory test. So this is called a reader recorder. Um, it was automated, but now a personal reader recorder is going to be allowed in for those with dyslexia. So it's an in-person service to help people who have trouble with reading and writing um, and that are on the that are dyslexic. Uh, you will need a letter of evidence to prove this and you can apply for extra time as well to complete your theory test. So that's good news for people who suffer from dyslexia and have the theory test coming up. Um, regarding the actual driving test, um, regarding the you know getting in touch and managing your application, you have to manage your driving test application on the My Road Safety online portal. Okay, The RSA say they cannot take any calls or deal with anything over the phone in terms of rearranging test dates or anything like that. So if you have any issues, don't ring them. Um, do it online. Um, the driving test, there's a lot of people who are not taking up their invitations. A report recently suggested that over half or almost half of people are not using the invite to take up a driving test within the 10 days that it's valid. So I certainly think that's interesting, but there could be good reasons too. I mean, they're not always going to suit people, those um, those invites. So um, another thing, if you do require an emergency uh, driving test, you can get one if you are a critical frontline worker, not a essential worker, that's kind of gone now. If you're a critical frontline worker, you can request an emergency test on the online portal. Okay, so just just you, but you need you have to satisfy certain criteria, which is available on the My Road Safety portal. Like you have to be, you know, in the health service, for example, like a doctor, a nurse, something like that. Um, the RSA is still determined to cut down the waiting times, and seventeen t temporary testers that were due to have their contracts expire have now been kept on for a further. Uh, period of time so that's good news in terms of tackling the waiting list for the driving test as regards the waiting list I'm not really sure what it is I just know that in Wexford it's about 10 or 12 weeks I know people that have given lessons to that have a test coming up now and it's they say it's not that bad about 10 12 weeks depending on if the invitation suit them it will vary from center to center it's going to be probably higher in the likes of Dublin and Galway and Nace but probably a bit lower in the likes of Wexford and other places like that so it all depends uh, on where it is but let me know in the comment section how long you've been waiting uh, because it'll be interesting for me to hear that and for other people as well um, 
what I have found actually in Wexford is that there there seems to be nearly as long a wait for an eye appointment to as part of your um application to get a learner permit. Um, I've ha- heard from one person there recently locally. He had to wait about nine weeks before he got an eye appointment to apply for his first learner permit. That's that was a bit of a surprise, all right. But with backlogs and COVID and all that kind of stuff, it's probably not that not that surprising. Um, what other updates do I have for you here? Yes, this one's for Wojciech. Um, I just made a note of the of some of the targets of the government strategy, 10-year strategy on road safety. So they're looking for a 50% reduction in road deaths and serious injuries. They're going to consider using more 30 kilometer speed limits in urban areas to make that more of a more of a standard thing because at the moment you'll find it in housing estates and designated areas like housing estates you'll have a 30 kilometer zone so I think you will see the 30 kilometer zone become more more prevalent as years go on. Um, there is also a very interesting proposal and that is to explore the idea of an online portal where people can upload video footage to report bad drivers because video evidence is likely to carry a lot of weight in court and um, that's why I, I think dash cams should be on every car. I think I think it'll certainly go a long way to um, dealing with the insurance fraud we have. But that was certainly an interesting idea. It's only an idea. They're going to explore um, the possibility of an online portal to upload footage of bad driving uh, to assist in prosecutions. Um, they're also hoping to have a thousand kilometers of segregated walking and cycling routes between 2021 and 2015. And the incidence of unaccompanied learners, learner permit holders, is hoped to be a thing of the past by 2025. That it will be so rare that it just won't be a factor. That's the plan anyway. And it also, as part of that overall plan to tackle second and third learner permit holders, they're hoping to decrease the incidence of a third learner permit. This may involve making a driving test mandatory after your second learner permit expires or to give smaller extensions on the second learner permit of four weeks or six weeks or something like that to give you enough time maybe eight weeks depending on what the average waiting time is for a test the the rsa and the government might have a smaller extension to a second permit rather than giving people one and two year extensions which is you know probably not the worst idea to be honest uh, so that is the plan to eliminate um, the incidence of unaccompanied learner permit holders and to reduce the incidence of a third learner permit happening. Um, as I said, maybe making tests mandatory. So there are some of the main recommendations from the government's 10-year road safety strategy. Some of them might come, in, might come into law, some of them might not, but they're certainly interesting ideas anyway. So I will be getting back to the comments there now folks let's have a look at the comments and see who's there and who has any questions or who's going to share some information with me so i think it was john ryan we said hello john thanks for tuning in discover ireland uh hi dana really like your videos thank you discover ireland good to have you michael ellis test on the 6th of january any tips on roundabouts on not taking too long to pull out yes um you'd be surprised if you're taking too long to pull out you know, there's not much point in me saying to you, go quicker. Because I know you need to go quicker. I know you want to go quicker. So I would, if I if you were, if I was giving lessons to you, I would bring you to a quiet car park and I would go around in circles and get you to practice moving off and stopping quickly and efficiently. That might mean bringing the clutch up a little bit quicker if you're driving a manual car. It might mean getting a little bit more juice it might mean the hand action from the from the steering wheel to the handbrake has to be about a millisecond quicker. You'd be surprised there's a lot of little things that could cause that. It could be psychological, it could be a lack of confidence, it could be that you just need more experience. But to cut a long story short, if you're having trouble pulling out and your progress is a weak point, I would certainly go to a nice quiet area and practice moving off without the pressure of someone behind you or yielding or whatever like that. Practice getting the bite, laying the handbrake down and go. So practice moving off with and without the bite. And that could help you then when you do come to a busy roundabout. It's a journey, not a destination. It's 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 more of a, it'll, it'll take practice and time probably, you know, that's, that's just the way it is. 
and there could be a number of aspects to that um, as well, Michael. But good luck to you in the test anyway, whenever, the, the 6th of January, sorry, you said, yeah. Olu Sola Crowns, hi then, hello to you too. Louise Downs, had my test on the 10th, passed and your videos helped me so much, thank you. Well, Louise Downs, Maradar Ross Gwelge, Mila Falter Road, August Cordicus. So well done to you, glad to hear you passed on the 10th, must be 10th of December. That was a nice early Christmas present and glad you were able to find the videos uh, useful. So thanks for sharing that and well done. Ash Ashish Machu Prakash. Hello, Dan. I watched many videos of you and I got a lot of knowledge on driving in Ireland. Ashish, you're very welcome. That's good news. Um, and good luck to you with your test if you have it. I'm not sure if you have it or not. But I'm glad the videos were able to point you in the right direction and keep up the good work. Discover Ireland again. I have joined the waiting list for Tala, I think you mean. The Tala Centre, yeah. Do you have any idea about the current waiting list? I don't because it varies from place to place. In Wexford, it's about 12 weeks. I don't know what it is in different parts. I'm hoping you folks might be able to share some information with me on that. Um, I think the the whole idea, the whole thing about waiting lists now, folks, is kind of, it's not as, as important or significant as it once was because with all these invitations getting sent out now to people, and you having a 10 day window of opportunity to take that invitation the like a, a waiting list is not really that accurate because there's a lot of things going on that the, that will alter that like it's not like there's a system and it goes in chronological order and it goes down one by one by one it's not like that anymore it's it's uh it's a little bit more nuanced than that but on average i think it's about 12 weeks maybe 16 weeks in the busier spots but again i'm only speaking anecdotally there but Discover Ireland, good luck to you in Tal anyway. Um, best luck to you in the test. Anustat, Anustat. Thanks, sir, for your help. That's, uh, you don't have to call me sir, but I appreciate the compliment. I learned a lot from I learned from you a lot. You're very welcome. If you have any questions, my email is at the bottom there in yellow writing, daintai at gmail.com. Um, if you have any questions, you want to look at your report sheet, uh, just email me. So best wishes to you, An Anustat. Ashish Machu Prakash again. I would like to get some tips regarding learner tests. Well, that's what this live stream is about, Ashish. Giving you tips, helping you, answering your questions. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll be sharing lots of tips with you. I'll be going through this driving test report sheet here where I got some good feedback from a candidate. I'll be going through the road signs there as well. If you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If you want to make a voluntary donation by PayPal, you can do it. Link will be in the description. And the My Road Safety website is there for applying and managing your driving test. NDLS in the blue is for applying for your learner permit and applying for your license. Theory test if you want to apply for your theory test. And my email is there if you have any questions. Okay, a couple more questions then, folks. And don't forget, we have some signs here as well. I know Wojciech has had a go at that. I'm going to get down to Wojciech's comment very soon. Uh, these signs are here as well, so let me know if you want to have an attempt at those. Um, have a go, and I'll you know I'll explain them in a minute anyway what they are. Okay, a couple more comments. We'll get down to Wojciech's one there, and uh, we'll see how we are. Um, where are we? Are Ashish was last, wasn't it? Fun, fun me, Ayodel, Ayodelji, I think. Good evening, Dan. My driving test will be coming up in January, and I'm kind of worried about my observation skills. So, do you mean? observation as in moving the head left and right at junctions like that looking like this at roundabouts getting the looks in is it mirror checks is it the blind spot moving off it, it depends on what you mean but by, by observation because there's, there's a lot to observation okay so if you're coming to a junction like a, a t-junction a stop sign you have to make sure that you do your looks early and often so don't wait until you get to the stop line and then suddenly decide to look left and right you should be doing this, watch my eyes and head here, you should be doing this here, see that? On the way up to the stop sign, and on the way up to the roundabout, but a bit more focus to the right. Keep the head moving, lots of quick looks, and then one last look. The last look is just as the front wheels cross the white line, just if you're going left, just that one last look to the right then. Make it quick, no staring, don't look the one way too long, keep the head moving. If you have any more specific questions about observational skills there, fund me, um, let me know. Okay, a couple more comments there. And we'll get on to the road signs, and I'm going to um, explain about this um, report sheet here as well. 
Um, Discover Ireland, I had joined... Oh, hang on there, lost you for a sec there. Uh, I had joined waiting list a month ago when I paid for the final test. Okay, good. So you're... Did you get an invitation to do, do the test or are you still on the waiting list? I think you mean you're still on it a month ago. Uh, so hopefully you'll hear something soon anyway. Um, and let, just let me know if you want to clarify that. But good luck to you on your Discover Ireland. And like I said, just let me know if you have any questions. Lorraine, Lorraine Bryan. Um, I don't know what that is there. Vartech. Okay. Wojciech anyway. So here's the signs, folks. I'm sure Wojciech is is gonna be on the ball here with these anyway so number one no entry yes number two um hospital that's correct number three mini roundabout yes mini roundabout that is important yeah number four is yield well is it really is it number four I'll come back to number four in a minute uh number five where are we pedestrian only street that's right number six bendy road yes number six lots of bends ahead Number seven, turn right, as in right now, you'll often see that. Um, that's depending on where you are, but if you see that, like you'll you'll, it means turn right, as in right now. Um, let me see. Number seven, turn right. Number eight, keep right. Yep. Yeah. So you might have an island in the middle of the road. So keep right of the island there, if there is an island. Number nine, road narrows. Yes, from the left. Number 10 is a clear way. Yes, indeed. They like asking that one. Number 11, speed bump. Yeah, speed bump or a humpback bridge either, perhaps. And number 12 is danger. That's like the exclamation mark there. It's just warning you of danger, like a hidden entrance or something like that ahead or a school ahead or something like that. Number four is, is technically correct. You said yield, but it's more of an advanced warning of a yield sign. So it's telling you that there's a yield sign further up. Um... But you know you're on the right track there. And discover Ireland. Then just one more before we before we I get into this, and I will get in down to Melissa and by me and Reba as well. There, would you recommend taking out car for practice on a learner permit? I know it isn't legal, but I have seen many are driving on the streets on the learner permit. So, well, there's nothing wrong with taking out a car. Like there's there's nothing wrong with doing that if you have someone with you. Um, I, I, I don't know what you mean. Let me see. I know it isn't legal. So if it isn't legal, I presume you mean driving alone. So I can't really recommend that now. You know, you, you if you're going to be practicing or driving on a learner permit, the rules are you have to have someone with you, whether that's an instructor or someone else with a full license or something. So uh, I don't recommend breaking the law. Discover Ireland, no. Uh, okay then, folks. So I got some good feedback here on this driving test. Um, it came in from a guy from Roscommon, I think it was actually, let me see, yes, Roscommon. And unfortunately he failed, now he didn't, he didn't fail too bad on the grade 2s, but the grade 3s are what really killed him there, as you can see, there's two grade 3s. So, he gave me some good feedback, let's hear the feedback. It was in County Roscommon, I'm not sure what part of Roscommon, but the roads were quite busy, he said, and they were also quite small and challenging. At one stage... <coughs> He was going from a minor road out onto a major road, could have been a T-junction or crossroads, and the lady stopped to let him go. So the lady was trying to do her good deed for the day and, you know, let him out by showing a bit of courtesy. But unfortunately, the driving test candidate here got a little bit confused. He froze a little bit and he waited too long. Um, the, the driving tester said to him that as they were approaching a pedestrian crossing, the tester said that there was somebody trying to cross, but the driving test candidate did not see this. Now, maybe he had tunnel vision. Maybe the, the learner driver wasn't focusing enough. He was just focusing too much on what was straight ahead. Um, he was surprised to hear this at the end when the tester told him, but the tester said it, then it, then it must be right. The tester doesn't have any reason to lie. It's nothing personal here when a tester fails you. At a roundabout then, he says he was taking the first exit to the left, and a big huge truck came up on the right lane so it was clearly a two or a three lane roundabout now the truck that came up beside him ended up blocking him blocking his view of the right so he was pretty much blinded by the truck um, on the right the learner driver here waited too long uh, for the truck to go whereas he probably should have crept up or crept forward a bit and you know lean lean forward to try and get a better view that's what the that's what he said happened around about that's probably on the 
uh, I say on the sheet there you can see position at roundabout so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's where that is I'll go through the, re the report sheet in more detail in a sec but I'm just letting you know what he said and what the tester said to him also um, he says at a couple of points there was a lot of parked cars in an urban area in whatever town it was in and the driving test Canada drove a little bit too slow tester said and his indicator was on all the time like do not have your indicator on for every single parked car. Just for the first car is enough. Because if you leave it on too long, people are going to think you're going to be turning right or overtaking someone else or something like that. So that was a bit of a misleading signal there. Now, he didn't say whether that was the grade 3 or whether that was a pedestrian one. He has a mark under reaction to hazards. It could be, although I, I thought it might be signals if, if that's the case, but it could have been that because he had the indicator on, it might have been a grade 3 um for giving the wrong idea um to other road users to other cars but it all depends on the tester sometimes they'll they'll mark on the reaction to hazards if a particular mistake doesn't fit obviously in any of the other categories and he knows on the reverse round corner the tester said it but he knows himself anyway that he went far too wide and he ended up much too far away from the curb so he he probably didn't steer enough he got the steering mixed up some way like if, if you're if you're too far out from the curb and you end up too far away clearly there's a problem with the steering in that you're not steering enough or maybe you're steering too slow so that was a feedback he also said he wasn't particularly happy with his turnabout he said he reversed too close to the curb on the turnabout but i don't see any mark on turnabout here so i'm not sure what what that what he was getting at there the turnabout seemed to go okay because there was no mark recorded on it anyway so Let's go down through the marks here. So, as you can see, I think there was eight grade twos. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight, and then two grade threes. So, um, he would have passed if it wasn't for the grade threes, but one grade three, even one red mark, one grade three is, is a fail, and nine or more grade twos is a fail. The grade ones don't really matter, but if, if you get too many grade ones in the one area, they may then evolve into grade twos, which could mean you know a fail it could count towards uh the grade twos but anyway position at roundabouts we think we know where this is as i said to you a few moments ago there was a truck came up beside him it blinded his view of things um tester said he should have crept out or made an effort to edge out the driving test candidate was probably a bit nervous didn't want to risk pulling out in front of cars so you have to drill deep here there's obviously a lack of confidence here okay maybe he's not confident enough using clutch control this is why before I even go out on the road with anybody, if I'm doing a driving lesson, I will always start off in a quiet car park. Get the basics of moving off and stopping with the handbrake and without the handbrake. And I will always make sure to do lots and lots of clutch control with somebody before we even get out of the quiet car park that I start in. Clutch control is a vital, vital skill. You can do it on the flat, which is a bit easier, um, and you can do it on the hill. It's basically little tiny little microscopic movements of the clutch with your left foot that allows the car to creep forward very, very slowly. It's like up to go, into slow. Up to go, into slow. Keep saying that and that can help you. The more subtle it is, the slower it is. Uh, you might need a little bit of juice if you're doing clutch control on the bigger hills, but usually um, you don't need much juice. So clutch control is such an important skill. That in conjunction with being comfortable with the handbrake can make situations like this a lot more manageable because if you're comfortable using the handbrake and comfortable and confident in getting the bite you shouldn't have problems uh, dealing with being blind if a truck comes up beside you for example so if you're in a situation like what this poor chap had to endure a big huge articulated lorry comes up beside you blinds you you're in the left lane you need to edge out creep out because you know, if you're in a little, small, little petrol car, you're probably going to have more opportunities to go than a big truck because the car theoretically should be able to take off quicker because it's nippier and it's, you know, should be easier to drive. A truck might have to wait a little bit longer. So if there's a 50-50 chance, for example, a truck might have to be absolutely certain, whereas a car could kind of get away a bit, you know, quicker, more efficiently. So if you do, if you are blinded by a truck, the most important thing is not panic, not get stressed. Find your bite or bring up your clutch. It all depends if you're on the hill or not. But just be very, very subtle with the clutch. Bring it up gently to, to where the biting point is and just edge up ever so slowly. If you're edging up, at least then the tester knows that you're making an effort to get a better view. 
remember the angle of the line at the roundabout is probably going to be slightly curved anyway so you should if you're in the left lane you should have that little bit more scope to edge out because if you're in the left lane of a roundabout depending on the roundabout you you probably are allowed to be a little bit further up than the car immediately beside you in the right lane um, that's usually the way it works anyway now it does depend on the roundabout at all I'm just thinking of some roundabouts here locally in Wexford so just very very subtly edge up bit by bit at the same time lean forward even if that means your chin is over the steering wheel temporarily so be it that's going to help give you a better view and you're going to show as well the tester that you're trying your best to get a better view to edge out carefully just make sure you don't do this and stare to the right the whole time because if you do that you will lose marks and observation you cannot stare to the right yes be aware of the right but just do what i'm doing here so you're looking right and just back like that and then right and then back straight again and right and straight again so when you look straight you're aware of any cues that are developing, you're aware of any cues already on the roundabout, and your peripheral vision kicks in as well for anything that could be on your, on your left side here. So, very often, mistakes that happen on a driving test, I find, can be traced right back to the basics of not doing clutch control when you started out, or not doing enough of it, not getting comfortable with the bite, not getting the balance right with the pedals. I know it can be difficult, I know it can be stressful, but I'm just saying what you have to try and do. If you are blinded by a truck, just try and edge out bit by bit so you can get a better view. Next one then was position turning left. Now I don't think he went into detail on that. The only positional thing there is what we talked about with the roundabout. Um, yeah, it's just no position turning. Now look, position turning left is I could list the type of things here. Um, not keeping left probably, you know. I mean, if, if you're turning left, usually this type of thing is at a T-junction stop sign or, or a crossroads of some type where the candidate is, is coming down towards the, the junction. And for whatever reason, they're just not left enough. Maybe they're getting focused on other things too much. Maybe they don't notice the little curve at the end um, of the road. Because very often at the end of a T-junction, the road will just kind of curve off to the left a little bit. And when that little curve becomes blind, as in you can see it no more, that is usually the time then that you do this with the wheel and steer the wheel to the left. How much you steer to the left, if at all, depends entirely on how much you know space you have to deal with. But very often, folks, as I said in one of my recent videos, having good position is very often linked to having good observation. You know, you must not have tunnel vision. So if you're coming up to a junction, whether it's a roundabout, T-junction, crossroads, or Y-junction, whatever it is, do not focus on the one thing too much. You have to get the work done bit by bit. So you maybe check your mirrors, indicate if you need to ease off the juice, you know, slow down gradually. All those things you're doing bit by bit, so you're not doing all the work at the end. It's important to spread out the workload as well, so you're not doing everything at the end. So have a look to the best of your abilities at how the road veers off, if at all, up ahead. So you might have a little small little curve to the left, you might have to watch out for the lane breaking up into two lanes. You might have a left lane and a right lane. You might have to watch out for the curb. Sometimes if you scrape the curb or clip the curb, it could be an issue. It all depends. But keep an eye on your arrows as well, like your road markings. But there was some mark on position turning left anyway. Probably not keeping left enough. Uh, maybe a bit too central, perhaps. Again, I don't know. It's hard to say. He didn't give me any feedback on that. But anyway, it was only one mark. Like It's not the end of the world. I'd be more concerned if there was two or three marks on it there. Um, so it was just the one mark. Moving down then to reaction to hazards. So he has a full set here. He's a grade one, a grade two, and a grade three under reaction to hazards. Now note it's it's react, okay? So the tester is basically saying here that you, you've kind of you've kind of gone beyond anticipation here. It's kind of like how you reacted in the moment. You know, it's like a a bad reaction, a late reaction. Now. It could be to do with the indicators here. He said there, what didn't he, that um, I, I'm surmising that the tester might have given him a mark on signals here. He might have thrown it in under hazard. So what happened was that the candidate said that on a, one or two occasions, I don't know if it was one or two or three, but on a few occasions anyway, apparently, when he was overtaking a long line of parked cars, he had the indicator on the whole time for nearly all the parked cars. That is a big, big 
no no if you're overtaking a line of parked cars first of all there is no need to indicate if you don't feel that you're moving out over the halfway line sometimes you may not need to bother indicating in housing estates either you, because you might already be out anyway so there's no point in indicating if it if it's not preceded by a, a movement you know what i mean like like only indicate an indicator is a is you highlighting that you're about to do something say to the right so if you're going to indicate you're telling people that you're going to move out or take a right turn up ahead so if you're not moving out at all and you're driving in a fairly straight line there's usually usually i don't want to give a, a catch-all answer but there's usually no need to indicate if you're just driving in a relatively straight line if you are overtaking a line of parked cars usually it's just fine to indicate until the first car like so when the front of your car gets level with the first car that you're overtaking the first car of the line of cars at that stage just cancel the indicator in fact it might even go off by itself it might it might self correct anyway but just just let it go off because there's no need to keep indicating because people could think you're taking a right they could think you're moving out again they could think you're taking a right turn into a driveway or another road and it's very very misleading if you do that it could be misleading to cars but it could also be misleading to cyclists or to people as well who might actually fancy their chances coming walking out in front of you because they might assume oh you're indicating right and you're you know you're you're maybe you're turning right so it can be dangerous it can be misleading and it's all down to practice and being used to your car so if you're using your driving instructor's car for the test, make sure you're very confident and comfortable with all the controls, whether it's the wipers or the lights or the indicator. Because the wipers, important to know about the wipers as well in the winter. A lot of rain forecasts for the next few days, so it's good to know how your wipers work, whether it's the back wiper or the front wiper or whatever. And the same with the signals, that you're comfortable giving them, flicking them on and flicking them off and not leaving them on too long. Because if you leave them on too long, it can be misleading. So... There was some other, there was obviously other reaction to hazards as well there, maybe not just the signals, I, I don't know, um, like it, it could be down to park cars as well, the other marks for hazards, the green one is only a minor one anyway, so it could be to do with some roadworks, it could be to do with not avoiding a pothole, it could be maybe even a speed bump, going too fast, going too slow over a speed bump, it could be a number of different things there, uh, as I said, very often the tester will put a mark under hazards if they don't clearly fit in under under other categories you know it's kind of hazards is like the is like the kind of the, the catch-all version of a mark so if you're if you're struggling to kind of find the right area they'll just give it you on hazards then as a, as a general area um progress well this is usually easy enough to clear up there's five altogether here and only one grade one so i wouldn't worry about that grade one it's just a minor one but we have two on the straight and two on progress turning right so basically too slow too slow on the straight road too slow on the right turn either pulling out from a major to a minor or from a minor to a major road now see how do i say this a lot of people end up driving too slow on the driving test because they're trying to portray um to the tester that they're extra safe and they're extra cautious but what i would say is if you have to portray that to the tester one you're insulting his or her intelligence because the tester doesn't need you to do that the tester is well able to make up their own mind whether you're a safe driver they're professional people they've been professionally trained you don't need to put on any kind of act or showcase your your degree in dramatics to show the tester that you're a good safe driver you have to view each situation differently so if you have a good safe clear road in front of you with no park cars no potholes it's a fairly good road surface uh, maybe one or two gentle bends but nothing major well then put the foot down and get up to the speed limit if the speed limit is 50 do 51 or do 52 give it some juice now having said that if it is a road where you're in town it might it might well be a, a decent wide road with a good surface but there's park cars on either side and you see a few warning signs like like a yellow warning sign watching out for children playing or something like that and maybe the bends are a bit more acute a bit more sharper well then i wouldn't say go 50 i'd probably say go 40 42 but it, it depends on the road you see I, I can't i can't give a one size fits all answer what i'm trying to say to you is you 
the learner driver, you have to judge the road in front of you. So ask yourself, how much can I see ahead of me? And how wide is the road? If you ask yourself those two questions, and if the answer is affirmative in both, so if it is, I can see way ahead of me, and I've got a nice bit of space either side, you're more likely to be able to reach the speed limit then. So in simple language, if it's a good safe road, give us some juice. If it's tighter with more parked cars, more potholes, more hazards, more pedestrian crossings, more ramps, well then don't. It all depends on the road you see. Anyway, progress on the straight, he was too slow on the straight road, he needed to give it more juice. And very often in this case, um, a lack of progress on the straight is actually quite connected to gears because he could have been stuck in second or third gear when he should have been up in third gear or fourth gear, depending on the individual circumstances, of course. But he needed to be a bit more decisive and show a bit more confidence here, yeah. Progress turning right. Now, this could be related to the incident he said he told me whereby he was um, some other driver, a lady driver, let him go. Um, he was going from a minor road to a major road. So he, let's say, for example, he was he was at a stop sign, let's say. He was a minor road, a stop sign or a yield sign or something. Um, lady driver stopped to let him go. He got confused and waited too long. And that's probably what caused him to lose marks here on, on progress. If another driver stops to let you go and they wave you out or they flash you with their lights to let you go, Okay, it's it's fine. You you can still go, like no problem, no problem. You can go, but just make sure you're giving the extra looks both sides, as if the other driver was not letting you go. Just because another driver lets you go doesn't give you the license to give us some juice, and go abruptly and go quickly because you still have to give the looks both sides, even if someone is doing a nice deed and letting you go. So. That's what happened here. I can understand why, you know, if someone lets you go, you're probably thinking, oh, should I, shouldn't I? But if you don't go, you're going to get marked for progress, probably, and you're going to look like you're lacking confidence and you're going to look a bit indecisive. Whereas, imagine if you're if the tester sees you and another driver gives you the option of going and you do everything exactly like you would do. You still do your looks, you do your last check just to be sure. Uh, you might you might even give a bit a quick thank you nod or a quick thank you wave if you if you can manage it as long as it doesn't take your hands off the wheel it doesn't cause any issue there's nothing wrong with giving a thank you wave no problem at all with that and the tester sees you managing that situation with confidence and with efficiency and not freezing and you know getting all indecisive it's going to look a lot better than if you just stay there and you know let the nerves get the better of you again I understand like don't forget I'm doing this job. How long am I doing this job now? 13, 14 years, whatever. So I, I can, like, I, I completely understand the mentality of a learner driver. I, I can understand how you might be a bit unsure there. But that's what happened anyway. That was at least one of them on turn and right. Another one on t progress turn and right could have been just being a bit slow, a bit indecisive. Now, when it comes to progress turning right, I always try and say to people as well, don't just think about the gap. So if there's if you're wanting to turn right, okay, and for example, there's a car on the left, for example, don't just think about the gap of, say, 50 metres between you and the car on the left. Think also about the hills. So are you on a downhill? That might give you more of an opportunity to go. Is the car that you're waiting on, is he on an uphill or a downhill? Because that could play into it as well. The car that you're worried about, are they accelerating are they picking up speed are they kind of staying the same speed or are they slowing down if they're about to hit a speed bump or go over a speed ramp or bump that might give you the opportunity to go out if they're about to slow down or stop for a pedestrian or a cyclist that could potentially give you the opportunity to go so you don't don't just think about the space yes think about the space because that's that's the first and the most obvious thing but think also about the hills how much of a hill they have how much of a hill you have um, if you give it a bit of extra juice and bring the clutch up a bit quicker, you could go. Then again, it might not be practical to go. It all depends. It all comes down to a lot of things, really, like being confident, getting your bite, keeping the head moving both sides. And that's why I always say, don't stare the one way. This is why observation is very often linked to progress, because if you're looking properly and you're aware on both sides of the road, like if you're turning right, like if you're turning right, you're going to be looking, looking both ways. So... If you're showing good observation, 
it's probably going to help you to avoid losing marks on progress because if you're looking well and you're giving good looks both sides and you're well in you know you know what's coming both sides you're probably going to be in a better position then to make the move also linked is being comfortable getting your bite and uh, being comfortable moving off if you're in a manual car um, so there's a lot of things to it it all comes down to practice and experience anyway so progress anyway so a bit too slow on the straight road and a bit too slow on a couple of right turns the reverse competency so he lost a red mark here at grade three so this was a serious one the tester categorizes this as dangerous or potentially dangerous and he said to me in the email that he went way too wide and he finished much too far away from the curb now if you are losing marks because you're going too wide more often than not it's down to two things either you turned the wheel too late or you didn't turn too late but you turned too slow before you start the reverse around the corner you will be given the opportunity to look at it first the tester will often get you to park before the corner and then you'll drive past it and park on the left so as you're driving past the corner you can have a little look into it like that and just give yourself an idea of what it's like like is it a is it a, is it on a hill is there children playing nearby but most importantly make a note of the angle of the corner so if it's a very sharp corner like like you know like that like really really sharp well then that means you're going to have to turn a little bit quicker because of the sharp angle now if it's a more of a gradual corner more more of a more of a rounded corner a gentle gradual corner well then you will have to turn a little bit slower so the answer lies in how sharp the corner is sharper corner sharper turns more gradual corner more gentle and more gradual turns what also helps here on the reverse around the corner is slow and steady speed and again we're coming back to what seems to be the theme of this live stream good clutch control not the first time i've mentioned that in this stream if you have good gentle clutch control and i and i have a video on that as well feel free to check it out or if you want me to email you the video i will where you're just very very gently moving up and down the clutch like that to give you a very very slow speed that means then that it's going to help you do the reverse in a better more efficient way so if you're reversing nice and slowly slowly and steadily as long as there's nobody behind you and all that um you're if you're if you're, if you're able to reverse slow and steady you're also going to hopefully be more confident with the looks because if you're going nice and slow you then should feel more confident to look behind you and in the mirrors and over both shoulders because if you're going slow and steady you should be fairly confident that nothing bad is going to happen because you're going so slow i mean if you're if you had bad clutch control and you were going really fast and swerving you probably be more glued to the side mirror because you wouldn't have confidence that you're under control so good clutch control there can help lay the foundations for so many aspects of driving but anyway to summarize he said he went too wide here anyway so it's probably down to not steering enough um but he also lost the mark on observation as well which is probably down to looking in the mirrors too much because usually when people lose a mark on um observation it's because they look in the side mirror for too long and that means that yeah you have a good view of the curb but you have a terrible view of what's behind you and very often you could have cars or you could have cyclists or you could have pedestrians walking across behind you and it's very important that when you're reversing around the corner you do your five point check that is three mirrors and two shoulders okay so you're when you're reversing around the corner or any kind of reversing here's how you should be doing okay you can you start with the left shoulder because when you start with the left shoulder you, you can kind of see out the back window and the back passenger window so it's, it's kind of a better all-around view and in fact sorry you should look all around you first anyway it's the first thing you should do is just get a good all-around check 360 degrees all around you then you go from the left shoulder then give a quick flick of the mirrors like that and then the other shoulder and you can go back to the mirrors again with this shoulder so you're not looking the one way too long and you're creating a, a 360 degree safety bubble by doing the five point check so looking at three mirrors and the two shoulders people ask me about letting the mirror down yes you can let the side mirror down if you want to but i don't recommend it because it, it, it kind of it seems like you're you're needing extra help or it seems like you're you know you need you need a crutch to reverse around the corner yeah you can do it it's just you can even ask the tester to let the mirror down for you if you want um if you can't do it electronically there's nothing wrong with letting the mirror down but 
I prefer if you have it up and you use reference points with the mirror in its natural position because at least then you're, you have a better view of what's behind you anyway. You know, if you have the mirror down, I always get concerned that people might actually look in the mirror too much if it's down and the observation might suffer. Maybe that's what happened here, I don't know. But um, anyway, competency, too wide. Probably didn't steer enough because if you, if you don't steer enough, you're probably going to go wide on the reverse anyway. And observation, probably just looking in, the, looking in the mirror too much and not looking behind over the shoulders. That's why people lose marks on observation on reversing around the corner for not looking behind over the shoulders. Okay then, so that's that driving test summarized. It's not the worst test I've ever seen. Um, the two grade three marks are concerning, of course, uh, but the grade twos are not too bad. I mean, the, the progress marks, I mean, if you took the progress ones out of it, you only got, what is it, four, four or five, four marks there, like, and progress marks should be, I mean, yeah, he was going too slow, but I mean, you know, it's not like they were dangerous or anything like that. So if he can, this is the type of test where is if, if the person can get a bit of practice, get some professional lessons from a professional driving instructor, and brush up on a few things and get a bit of practice, he should have a great chance next time. Okay, so let's get back to some comments then, folks, and find out where the last comment was there. There's a few to catch up on here. Um, I know we don't void checks uh, road signs there. Uh, Fiona, I'll get down to Fiona in a second. Uh, let me see. Just find the comments here. So Melissa, I think, wasn't it? Melissa? What's the most asked question in the driving test? I do you mean about the driving test or the actual theory questions in the driving test? In in the if it's in the driving test theory questions, you see it's a tough one because the testers kind of come and go and and they, they, they do try and mix them up, but usually they will ask you about pedestrian crossings, the flashing amber lights the amber lights, the clear way, um, you know, things like that. The, the zigzag lines get asked, uh, overtaking on the left, when can you overtake on the left? Like, for example, if the car in front is turning right. Um, they would probably be the most common question. But actually, actually, the, the most common of all is probably about the yellow box, I'd say. Yeah. Um, I, I, they almost always, in my experience, ask about the yellow box. So what's the rule with the yellow box? Don't stop in it. No parking, no blocking the yellow box, but the exception is if you're turning right, you can roll up into the yellow box then um, for a right turn, as long as you don't cause any obstruction and as long as you don't st stay there permanently. So, like, for example, you might have to use the yellow box at the lights, for example, traffic lights. So the yellow box is probably the most common theory question, Melissa, if that's what you mean, but um, feel free to clarify if that's what you mean down further down, if you're still here. Um, and best of luck to you, Melissa. By me or be me whatever that name is some great names out there folks how many fail theory question hang on let me just start it again how many fail theory question in grade two uh not really sure what that question is but i'm going to give an educated guess um i don't know i'm not sure how many people fail the theory test you, you, you can't fail the driving test on the theory alone the, the most you can get is a is um a grade two mark on the theory how many get the grade two i i don't know not not many of the people i give lessons to anyway because i always try and make sure that they do the work in but for people that email me i see a, quite a few marks on it um if i was to give a guess maybe three out of ten emails i get have marks on the theory uh for the driving test but that would just be an educated guess um it's a shame really because it is only a small part of the test but it can give a good impression now you can't fail on the theory alone but it could be a mark that causes you to fail through the accumulation of mistakes. But um, try and revise your rules of the road. Know your road signs, like the 12 road signs on the screen there. And that can help get you off to a good start in the test. And it can show the test that you've done your homework as well. And it can, you know, the tester's more likely to have a bit, a bit more confidence in you if you get off to a good start and you nail the questions and technical checks at the start. Reba Luda is yeah um what's exactly the biting point i just can't get it what's well, a good question rebuild luda the biting point is when you accelerate gently okay let, let me just go through it from the start okay? i'm gonna i'm gonna pretend you're a learner driver okay because it's easier when i visualize you sitting beside me in the car okay so I, you're beside me in the car okay i'm going to instruct you here's what i do 
Okay, go into first gear. Then you get a little bit of juice, just a slight bit of acceleration without looking at the revs. Try to look straight ahead and then keep the revs consistent. Then, this is, this is why the handbrake is up now, by the way. The handbrake is up, okay? So you're in first gear, get a bit of acceleration. Then you bring the clutch up about halfway or maybe just beyond halfway. When you do that with the revs and with the handbrake up, the car is going to give a little bit of a, a kick. It's going to like rise a little bit. It's, it's, like a, it's like a little lift. Now, when you get that lift or that little connection, that's called the biting point, okay? Now, you hold the biting point, as in you hold your feet very, very still. And when it's safe to go, then you just let down the handbrake and off you go. Bob's your father's brother. I have a great video on that, Reba, on how to move off properly for drivers. If you want me to email you that, just, just email me here, danetai at gmail.com. But that's what the biting point is. It's something I always do with people when I have them as beginners. Get them used to the biting point so that they're comfortable moving off quicker on flat and on hills. Because it's not just to stop you rolling back. The biting point is great to avoid rolling back, yes. But it's also to move you off a bit quicker at roundabouts like we had in this test when he, he, he was delayed moving off. So it can give you confidence moving off on the flat and on the hill. It's a great skill. Uh, nobody leaves the car park with me unless they have a good knowledge of the biting point. Um, so hope that answers that, Reba. Let me know if you want me to clarify down further or email me here if you have any uh, more details, any, any other questions, I mean, any more details you want. Uh, Scott Doyle. Uh, hi, Dan. Thanks for the videos. Great help. I have my second attempt of the test on the 4th, 4th of January, I presume. Need to be more careful with right turns with a lack of road markings this time. Yeah, see, it's all down to what is the individual problem with you, Scott, um, the last time. Now, on that, just remember, okay, is this your second? Yeah, it's your second test, okay? So, just because something went wrong the first time does not mean it's going to go wrong the second time. In fact, it's probably less likely to go wrong because now, according to your comment there, you're much more aware of it, okay? So you said there that your second test, you have to be more careful with right turns and a lack of road markings, yeah. So you're now very aware of that. So don't let it dominate your mind. Because you're aware of it, you're probably less likely to make mistakes on that. Now there's not, if you're, like if you're doing a driving test, you're probably doing a driving test in town and most towns are well marked out. Now, there's always going to be certain sections of road that, that certain sections of towns and cities that don't have road markings, maybe, but most of them do, in fairness. So hopefully that won't be as much of an issue to you. It reminds me of a driving test report sheet that was emailed into me about two months ago when the person was taking a right turn and the person she incorrectly thought it was a one-way street. So because she thought it was a one-way street, she ended up in the, we we'll call the right-hand side of the road. And that means that in actual fact, it was a two-way street, but she didn't know it because there was no road markings. And another car was trying to come in and she was on the wrong side and she failed on position turning right because she was in the wrong side of the road, basically. So if you're in any doubt on an unmarked road, always, always keep to the left, okay? At least the left half of the road, if there's any doubt, okay, on an unmarked road. Jibin Jose, hello to you. I got my license last week. Well, that's great news. I know Jibin is a semi regular, I, that, the name rings a bell, so it looks like he or she is not going to be as much of a regular now. But that's good news too. Your videos really helped me a lot. That's good. Um, thanks so much. You're very welcome, Jibin, Jose. Um, uh, congratulations on your great news. That's, that's brilliant news. Um, well done. Full European license now. So uh, congratulations. Um, a couple of comments there. I can't really read or retract. It. Sorry. Melissa, again, that's my issue with the clutch I cut out from lift, lifting my foot too quickly. Yes. So, Melissa, you probably haven't heard of the five-second rule, okay? I can email you my video on this if you want. Just send me an email, dayandtai at gmail.com. If, like, when you're moving off, okay, and you have your bite, and you let the handbrake down, and the car starts moving. But whenever the car starts moving, when you're moving off, and the car starts making forward momentum, goes forward, just keep the feet still for five seconds, Okay. Or at least four anyway, but five for a beginner. If you keep your feet still as the car moves off, 
you're going to have a nice smooth takeoff, okay, if you're driving a manual car. And the days of manual cars are dwindling, folks, because as we as electric cars become more more and more popular, um, manual cars will become less and less popular. But while we're all driving manual cars, you have to have steady feet moving off. And as I said, that's another reason why I always go into detail on clutch control of people, because the getting the bite, understanding the five second rule is crucial, so is clutch control. That's why when I do that with people, they very rarely have any issues cutting out when they get out on the road with them. And even if they do, we're able to ask why that happened, why do you think it happened? And they're able to say to me, well, I didn't do enough clutch control there, or I lifted a clutch too quick. If you lift your clutch too quick when you're moving off, you're going to get a jump and you might even stall or conk out. So thanks for clarifying that, Melissa. Foy check. Dobra man shizna. Tip for next streams, put fewer signs. Uh, yep, yeah, because there is a limit on the length of the messages in chat. People who want to answer may feel restricted and not write everything they know as I did with four. Oh, yes, I see, I see. That's because I was surprised you got that wrong. I was, I would have always expected a hundred percent from you, Void Check. Yeah, uh, and you weren't completely wrong. You just, just I didn't read. I didn't. I, I understand what you mean. Yeah. Um, I don't normally put that much signs up. I think I did that because the driving test sheet underneath it there was so small. So I tried to try to make it all fit so it kind of looks more neat but yeah usually four or eight signs is, is, is enough anyway I'll, I'll, I wouldn't usually put 12 up like that yeah um okay but thanks for the tip Wojciech as ever uh being a Polish chap uh nice and direct and blunt and straight to the point as I know very well with Polish people great people um Ashish Machu I would like to know how the important documents requires for a learner test can i book the test and attend the test with my passport i have my ppsn number but i'm waiting for my gniv uh, and psc now are you talking about the learner test what's this learner test you mean the theory test um or the driving test i'm going to see one thing important documents required for a learner test Learner, learner, driver, maybe you mean driving. If you're turning up for a driving test, um, let me see now, you have your PPS and that's good. Um, if it's the driving test you're talking about, I'm, I'm presuming when you say learner you mean that, it, the only ID you need is your learner permit, that's all. Um, you don't need any other um, ID, uh, you just need to have your learner permit, that's all. Um, for the theory test, I'm not sure, you'd have to check out the theory test uh, website. I'm sure, like you won't, you won't have a, you won't have um, a learner permit there because you haven't got it yet. But I'm sure if if ID is is what you're looking for, I'm pretty sure a passport will be fine. But just clarify that on the on the theory test website, and that'll be the best place to go for that. Um, Olu Sola Crowns, hi then. Am I likely to have the same tester for my next test? Good question, actually. Um, yes and no. It depends on the rota and it depends on the test center. I had a lesson there, I had a test there with a chap, um, and he had the same test, he, he did his test, um, say in September sometime, I didn't know him then, he failed with 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 a certain tester, when he did his test with me there in December, he passed, and he had the same tester, they, the RSA will try to not give you the same tester, but as far as I'm aware, they don't have any software or any way of knowing who tested you, and who, or the, the last time so the chances are you could have the same tester but the rsa tried to minimize that possibility because they they will rotate the testers from time to time as well so for example in the southeast you might have testers that could be in wexford one week then they might be in gory they could go down to waterford maybe carlow and that will be done on a regional basis so it's it's a hard one you're probably not going to have the same tester, but you could. It just depends on how many testers are there. It could depend on who's sick or on holidays. Um, it's a tough one. Um, hard to answer, but, you know, there's no guarantees in this game. Actually, you must submit your GNIB or passport for your permit to be processed based on own experience. Okay, yeah. Um, so there's some advice there from Olu. Um Fionn Duncan, hi, I need a job for delivery driver, good stuff, and I've done 12 lessons, 
but I need to wait three more weeks to hold my permit. Can I try get a test? No, you have to, I presume you're talking about the six month rule here, Fionn. You have to have your learning permit for six months. There's no exception to that six months uh, rule. If you turn up for a driving test and your learning permit is five weeks, uh, or sorry, five months and a week old, your test will be canceled, you'll lose your fee, and you'll have to reapply again. The RSA will say it's up to you, the learner driver, to make sure that your learner permit is in good order. It's not up to the RSA, so the responsibility lies with you. Um, three more weeks, you know, it's not exactly an eternity. So you know, just just hold the whole hang in there. You, you you know, when you hopefully you live to be eighty or ninety years of age, and three more weeks is not going to make a big difference. But best of luck to you anyway, Fionn, um, with your journey. Um, hope it all goes to plan for you. Lit. Costello got my test coming up mid January. I'm a little nervous for it. Yes, I know, and that brings me on to my next point on nerves. Actually, nicely. So thank you for reminding me of, about that, Lit, Lit Costello. I'm hoping to do a video on driving test nerves in the next few weeks. Okay. Now I am not a psychologist. I'm not a psychotherapist. But there are some important points I would like to share with you on driving test nerves in that video. But I want to share with you an experience I had myself recently, actually, that might help you. I had my own driving test there about two weeks ago, okay? Two weeks ago. It's, it's called a check test. Driving instructors have to undergo these check tests every two years. And to be brutally honest, I hate them. Um, it's like a dark cloud hanging over me in the weeks beforehand. But I know they have to be done so I can keep my registration with the RSA. What happens is... I get tested to make sure I'm keeping up to scratch. So I will. I, I had a learner, a, a learner driver with me, a uh, young girl I'm giving lessons to, and I turned up at the appointed time in the Wexford test centre. And the driving examiner then would sit in the back for the hour or so of the test, and he would observe how I'm doing and how I'm interacting, and then he gave me the result um, at the end. Now, na naturally enough, I passed, obviously, but. It is still uh, a nerve-wracking experience in some ways. But this time, I wasn't nervous. And I, the reason I wasn't nervous was because I followed the psychological tips that I read in a recent book on meditation. I have a bit of an interest in meditation. And I'm going to share with you in more detail um, the tips I had in that book, uh, the tips I learned from that book that I applied. But I will summarize some of them very, very briefly for you, um, in, sh in short. When the driving test came around I had to I I waited with the learner driver in the car park the examiner rang me then from the test center so he said hello Dane this is such and such I, I'm here to perform your driving instructor check test now from the moment he rang me I just completely focused on everything he said to me so when he was ringing me and I was talking to him I was completely and utterly absorbed in the words he was saying so he basically said to me I will come to the door and meet you there in about two minutes. So I got out then, I made sure my phone was on silent, got out, closed the door, waited at the door, and I just I just focused on waiting for him. When he when he met me, he was all very, very polite, very, very professional. When he met me, I went into the test center and he said, nice to meet you. We didn't shake hands or anything like that. I think we might have done an elbow tap, I'm not sure. But I was completely focused on what he said. Next question he asked me, now, Dane, if you'd like to use the restroom or the men's room or the toilet, the restroom sounds very American. If you'd like to use the toilet, it's there. So I did actually need to use the toilet. So I completely focused on that step. I, I, I kind of focused on my steps. I focused on the fact that I pushed the door. I turned the lock. I went for a number one. I listened to the noise of, the, of my number one hitting the water. Then I flushed the toilet, listened to the water flushing. Then I washed my hands. And I really became very aware of my hands rubbing and then I dried my hands, then I opened the door and I was very, very aware of all. So I was so aware of all this stuff in the lead up to my test that I was focusing on this so much that I didn't have time to be nervous or anxious. I was absolutely amazed at how calm and how, how not nervous I was. I, I'm, I am, this is the God's honest truth. I went into the office then with him anyway. He politely asked me to sit down, he had a look at my driver's license, 
everything he said I just completely and utterly zoned in on what he said so when he asked me to show him the license he said he wouldn't touch it but just to turn it over for him and all that then he offered me a face mask he said he'd prefer if I use this mask I said absolutely fine it doesn't bother me what mask I use so I completely focused on taking the mask out and swapping it over then he asked me some questions about the person that I that would be doing the test with me I answered those questions in a detailed and short succinct way and then he said after a few more formalities I he asked me to read something and sign something and then come out and I was completely focused on everything he was saying I was focused on my feet hitting the ground I was just basically to, to keep it short and simple I was just so focused in the present moment because a lot, a lot of the reason that people get nervous and anxious whether it's a driving test or whatever is because they're worried about the past or they're stressed about the future so if you live in the present moment as I did following the tips from that meditation book I was amazed at the results I was not one bit nervous from now I was nervous up until he rang me but when he rang me I completely zoned into listening to the tester listening exactly to what he was doing and being extremely aware of what I was doing after he rang me I was basically living in the present moment not the past not the future not some third dimension and because of all that I just didn't have time to be nervous and because I wasn't nervous I felt so confident and so focused my mind was clear and I didn't have any blockages in my mind I just felt as if I was on my own and it was all down to living in the present moment and not thinking about the past or the future okay so that's just to follow up on Lit Costello's good question there about having our test in mid-January. A little nervous. Lit, if I'm saying that correctly, I hope those tips help you. I am hoping to make a more detailed video on driving test nerves based on my own experience of doing my own instructor's exams and on the books I've read on meditation. So hopefully in the next week or two I'll have a video on that. Okay, folks, so we're gone past the hour now. I'm still going to be with you for a while more. Um, have I anything to add here? I just want to make sure I have all my updates are there for you. Um, yes, yes, we've done all that. Okay, so I'm going to go through those road signs again. just want to make sure nobody else has had a bit of a stab at them before I do. Don't think so. Um, so the road signs here, I'm going to get back to, I'm going to get straight back into the comments, folks. Just going to have a look at the road signs again. Number one, okay, number one, no entry. Number two is a hospital. Um, number three, mini roundabout. Number four, advanced warning of a yield sign. Number five is a pedestrianized street or pedestrianized zone. Number six, lots of bends ahead, bendy road ahead. And uh, number seven, turn right. Number eight, keep right. Number nine, road narrows from the left. Number ten, clearway. So that's no parking or stopping. Eleven is uh, speed bumps or humpback bridge maybe. And number 12 is a warning sign of some hidden danger up ahead or some something some danger up ahead like like a like a concealed entrance or something like that okay let's get back to the comments then um by my or by by me from major road to minor road allowed to stop on yellow sign only when turning right yeah okay i think you mean a yellow box here i'm, I'm guessing by me um so let me just like some from a major road to a minor road yeah so you you are allowed to stop on the yellow box uh, well generally you're not allowed to stop on the yellow box but the exception is if you're turning right and that could potentially be from a major road to a minor road yeah so you could be like on a like 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 you could be on the main road going straight and then there's a little side road to the right you are allowed to stop on the yellow box there if you're turning right because if you don't you're going to be too far back or too far forward so it wouldn't be practical so I hope that answers your question there. Um, this was thinking of what I was saying as well. Yellow box, yeah. By my again, if I'm saying that correctly, there was another person from the test center sitting behind us, the tester <coughs> and me, which made me more nervous. Um, yes, yellow box means he or she means. Oh yes, so so there was somebody else in the back, which well. <laughs> I know that's like I had my own test there two weeks ago, so trust me, I can uh, I can certainly relate to that. So that's a good point, folks. Sometimes, um, on certain occasions, when you're doing the test, you will have your regular driving tester in the passenger seat, and there may be 
um, a supervisor in the back seat, just observing that everything is going okay and acting to make sure standards are kept high and all that kind of stuff. So it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen from time to time. I know it can be extra nerve wracking, but if it's any consolation, try and think of the, <coughs> excuse me, the supervisor in the back, he's more looking at the driving tester rather than looking at you. But it is a possibility that you should be prepared for. It doesn't happen that often now, but it, it does happen from time to time as part of the quality control efforts of the RSA. Um, Joy, Joy or Joy, uh, Dane, what are the best, worst times to take your test? Um, look, I'm not sure if there are any time. Okay, look, to answer your question, probably half nine, ten o'clock is the best time because it's usually quite enough, uh, especially at this time of the year, you know, like the time of the year between like after Christmas but before the first week of January is a great time to do the test like you know you're there's not much traffic out in the morning well not usually anyway I mean it can depend on where you are but usually it's quite enough on holidays uh, like Christmas holidays in the morning time so that would be the best summertime as well when the schools are off and maybe quarter past nine half nine in the morning they're usually the best times tougher time busier time could be around lunchtime maybe around three o'clock half three if the schools are kind of coming in and out but then again if there's busy traffic and traffic is moving slower wouldn't you say that gives you more time to think ahead and you, you can kind of see more things you know so it's good if you're a good enough driver and you're well prepared you'll be able to manage any time but uh that's what i would say anyway but you know something could happen at half nine in the morning that might not happen at three o'clock at a busy time it, it's all you know anything can happen on the day uh ck i'd recommend taking it in the dark not sure what that's in reference to shane o shane o'donnell my car automatically puts the mirror down when you go into reverse so that's what happened in my test it was grand <clears throat> it's an interesting point and it kind of reminds me of something i was going to say earlier that i forgot as we go on cars are becoming more and more automated so they're going to become more like for example the handbrake very like very very soon the the push button handbrake where you push it in and manually let it down that's going to be a thing of the past because you're going to have automatic handbrakes automatic electric handbrakes brakes becoming more common now um automatic cars are becoming more common as they become more electric and you can see here automated mirrors so that's the way it's going you're going to have a lot more cars with reversing cameras reversing sensors all that kind of stuff and it's great it's going to make driving safer anyway and don't be afraid to use and embrace your car's technology as well. But just like, just be careful if you're if you have a reversing camera, you can certainly use it for the test, no problem. Just don't just don't look at the camera all the time. You have to make sure you you look over your shoulders as well and look in your mirrors all around you because you don't. While the reversing camera and the parking sensors are handy, they're very convenient. You know they're not the be all and end all. You still have to keep your head up and keep your eyes moving. You don't want to be lulled into any false sense of security due to your car's technology. Melissa, yep, that's right. Thanks for the heads up. No problem, Melissa. Best luck to you. Um, Murat Yilmaz, how, hi, how are you? I'm Turkish. I have full Irish B license. Do you have any after truck questions and answers? No, I don't. Well, I don't, but you can get the Theory Test app, um, Murat. You should be able to download that from the Apple Store or Google Play um i know what's it called the driver driver theory test app i think um you'll find a link to it on the theory test website i'm sure and you should you should find lots of uh lots of questions there and lots of help there you can also get the the, the driver theory test cd rom and you can you can use that as well if you have a computer that has a cd or dvd drive uh, that's very helpful you can do mock tests on that as well discover ireland on average oh, hang on there how many mistakes can we make of the grade one to in order to pass the test? Well, the grade ones don't 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 um, count towards marks unless you get too many grade ones and then they evolve into grade twos. But generally, if you get too many grade twos in the one area, so if you get four in a row, like for example, uh, four four reaction to hazards, that that's a fail. If you get too many under the one heading, so if you get say for example under progress this candidate here the report sheet on the screen got two on straight two turning right now if you got two more on position on progress turning left for example that have been six under the general heading of progress six or more under a general heading such as progress or hazards or position that'll be a fail too 
But usually people feel, well, usually most of the time anyway, it depends on the person of course, if they get nine or more grade two marks. So nine or more grade two marks is a fail. And that's how I would say the majority of people end up failing the test. Now a significant amount of others will get um, grade threes, like this fella here did, got two grade threes. But it all depends on the on the day, it all depends on the person. Um, Alien123, hi then, do you know if the validation of the duration of the 12 EDT lessons is extended over five years because of COVID? Should I contact the RSA? I don't think that's there's any extension on the 12 EDT lessons. Um, I haven't heard of any such extension. The only extensions I've heard of are for the extension for learner permits and for full licenses. Um, but I haven't heard of anything um, for the EDT lessons. No, I'm pretty sure there's no extension there. You can contact the RSA if you want, but I, I'm pretty sure you'll get, you'll get the same answer I gave you. Not me. Hi, I sent you an email with my results. You're great. Uh, I'll have a look at that. I'll get back to you in the next day or two, I hope. Scott Doyle, your explanation of quarter turns when doing the reverse around the corner helped me is that section of the test. That's good, Scott. That's good. I just try to teach the way I would like to be taught. So what Scott is talking about there is the quarter steers when reversing around the corner. And what I advise people, if they're having trouble reversing around the corner, if that's if that's the like if that's the wheel straight there and you're a little bit far away but you're not too far away just give it a little quarter turn like that and then hold the wheel and give it time to react because a lot of people end up doing too much turns and they end up doing all these zigzags all over the shop and sometimes when you're reversing around the corner you just have to turn the wheel and give it time to react now i, I do go into more detail on my reversing around the corner videos if you just search dan toy quarter turns or dan toy quarter steers you'll get that video on youtube Reba Luda, if you hit the curb on your test, is that a fail? Um, not necessarily. It depends on how hard you hit it or how fast you hit it. If you only give it a light scrape, it's probably not going to be a big deal. But if you hit it and you go up on the curb, that's probably going to be a fail. If you're speeding, let's say 55, where 50, is that a mark or a fail? That'll just be a mark. It wouldn't be a fail. It depends on the context as well, of course. If you're doing 55 and you're a bit late stopping for the pedestrian crossing because you didn't give yourself enough reaction time well you could say that could be a fail then but that's an extreme example generally speaking if you're only going five kilometers over the speed limit it's not a big deal you'll probably lose a mark maybe a grade one maybe a grade two it can depend on the road but it's not usually a straight fail no it just depends on the context if anything it's probably my job is trying to get people to go faster, not go slower. Um, but, you know, don't follow. Hi, then. i just like to tell you I passed my test good and would like to thank you for all the video, wonderful videos. You're very welcome. Don't follow. Glad to hear you passed and glad that the videos were able to help you out on your journey. So congratulations to you. Okay then folks, so I'm going to be finishing up there now very, very, very soon. I want to get the last of these comments in and um, as I said there, if you do want to email me, dayandtai at gmail.com, I will get back to you with some tips and advice. If you want to share me your report sheet, do that. I'll email you some feedback. Um, but if you are emailing me in a report sheet, please give me some information. Let me know what the tester said. Let me know what you thought went wrong. The more information I have, the more helpful it's going to be, okay? Uh, let's see. A couple more comments then, folks, before we wrap things up. Um, and I go and see how Liverpool are getting on against Leicester. Big Liverpool fan I am. Um, where am I? Oh, CO, is it? Hi, Dan. Are there any restrictions on doing your tests in a car that has tinted windows? Yes. You're not allowed to do them if they're overly tinted. Now, if they're only... A little bit tinted it's probably not too bad I remember when I started out one of my first um, one, of my, one of my very early driving tests tests I had it was a big mistake I made and that the girl doing the test had tinted windows on her car and I never I just never copped it it was just one of those things I just never never copped because, because I was probably so focused on her and the actual driving and her issues and her mistakes I never copped it and I always remember then when I was looking at her I was kind of about 200 meters away as she was going out 
I could see the tester slowly, slowly walking to the car, and I could see the tester doing this, doing this in the windows, kind of checking his reflection, and I just knew straight away. It kind of dawned on me then. I said, oh, my God, how am I going to face this girl now? Uh, she was grand. She was very sound about it anyway. And, but um, if, you're, if your windows are overly tinted, uh, you're not going to be allowed to do the test. Your test will be cancelled. You'll lose your fee. You'll have to reapply again. So if there's any doubt on the tint, either take them off. Sometimes you can peel that stuff off anyway. Or use your instructor's car. Or, or just, just don't don't let happen to you what happened to that girl anyway. I, I remember I being, I was mortified when that happened. Yeah, But look, at, mistakes happen. You learn from these things. Um, okay, let's finish up here now. I'm going to try and get the comments in. And we're going to wrap things up. Um, do Agent Vorbert big quite ask? Do I do? Do you do tests? Um, do I do tests? No, I don't do tests. No, I'm I'm an instructor. I I, I teach people how to drive, but I I more so focus on YouTube. Shane Cashin, <clears throat> have my test in two days. Just want to say I've been watching your guides coming up to it. I want to say thank you. You're very welcome, Shane Cashin. And best of luck to you in two days. Just take it one road at a time, one stretch of road at a time. That's what you have to do. Uh, and good luck. Email me, Shane, if you have any questions. Um, Marion Sharp, your dreams. Okay, thank you, Marion. Grace Redmond, hi then. If I'm second in the queue of traffic and the lights turn green, hang on, I just lost you for a second. Here you go. And the lights turn green, should I drive up into the junction box or wait until the first car clears the junction? Well, actually, that's a good question. You've reminded me of something. When, when I had my own driving test, my own check test, I asked the driving tester two questions and one of them was actually that question there so thank you very much grace for reminding me about that so i had my own driving exam driving instructor exam and at the end i took the opportunity to ask the senior rsa examiner if there's if you're at traffic lights and there's two cars at the traffic lights and the first car goes up into the middle of the box then there's a second car say i'm the second car so do i follow the first car up into the middle or do I stay back? This is what I asked the senior RSA driving examiner. I before I before I before I before I um, finished asking the question, I, I I asked him just to let me answer first so I can see if I'm right or not. So I said, so what I would do is I would say it depends on the junction, okay? And I would say in general, at a small set of traffic lights, do not follow the first car up. But if it's a bigger set of lights, you should follow the second car up as long as it's safe to do so. That was exactly what the driving examiner said. He did agree with me that it's a bit of a grey area, but if it's a small set of traffic lights, do not follow the first car up because you could end up getting stranded on a pedestrian crossing or something like that if the first car stays stuck in the middle. But the bigger ones, yes, you should be able to follow the second car up. And he said something very interesting to me then as well. He said that if, the, if you're the second car in the middle of the junction and the, and the first car, the car that was there first, ends up staying in the middle and you as a second car are there behind the first car what happens then and the examiner said well you're still going to cause an obstruction so the rsa examiner said to me if that's the case then the second car has to make an effort to get out of there so that means the second car has to kind of try and overtake the first car and clear the junction in order to avoid causing uh, causing an obstruction he agreed it's a bit of a gray area he agreed there's nothing in the RSA rules of the road to clear this up. I sometimes think it's a deliberate grey area so as you know it doesn't cause any issues in court or anything like that. But I can only tell you what the examiner said said to me. I was surprised I must admit I was surprised when he said that the second car should still clear the junction. But that's what he said anyway, and uh, you know, that's a senior examiner telling me that. Uh, so I hope that clears it up. I don't know if it does clear it up for you, but uh, I hope it it helps you anyway. Um who, who was that? Grace, was it? Grace, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I also asked him as well about over, overtaking on continuous white lines. And again, I, I said to him, look, I, presume, I always tell learners that it is okay to cross the continuous white line if you're overtaking something. Because some learners are a bit nervous about doing that. Of course, he agreed. Generally speaking, you should not cross the solid white line. And you should definitely take the hatch lines very, very seriously. There, You should treat them like curbs. But sometimes in driving, if you have a good clear gap in front of you and you need to show practicalities in driving, you can't just stay behind a slow moving vehicle indefinitely or for, you know, five minutes, whatever like that, when there is an opportunity to overtake just because there's a continuous white line there. 
So in order to promote a more pragmatic and practical sense of driving, yes, you are allowed cross, excuse me, the continuous white line to overtake an obstruction such as a tractor or a cyclist or something like that, just in order to be practical. Um, so hopefully that helps you there, Grace. By my, thank you. You're very welcome. By my or be me, if I'm, however I'm saying that, some great names out there, folks. You're very welcome and best of luck to you in your driving. Um, okay, folks, going to be calling in night there now soon. Just want to get these comments. And Shane O'Donnell actually had to go through a very tight gap in a housing estate towards the end of my test. A flatbed lorry and a seven-seater car <coughs> were parked opposite each other. The gap was very tight. Sounds like that was a bit of a challenge there, Shane. And that's what it's all about, overcoming challenges. Taking it one road at a time, one step at a time. But that does sound like a bit of a tricky situation. Um, and you're continuing down here. Naturally, I went as slow as possible. But I did end up pushing the seven-seater mirror uh, with my mirror. I thought I definitely failed because of that. But to my surprise, the tester told me I had passed. And that just goes to show you, folks, sometimes in driving, you need to be practical. Now, I don't mean hitting mirrors or anything like that. But the tester kind of weighed up that situation and gave Shane O'Donnell there the benefit of the doubt. And it, and it also goes to show you, just because you you might make a mistake, it doesn't mean it's a fail. Like, you know, you, ha you have to keep going anyway, because even if you make a mistake, it doesn't mean that, it ha that it's fatal. And Shane goes on to say, he said I was going so slow that there would have been, not have been any damage done to the mirror. Uh, the only car there might have had some slight damage would be my own. Yeah, again, it's all down to practicality. So that's interesting feedback there, Shane. Thank you for sharing. Discover Ireland, you're very welcome. You're saying thank you there, appreciate your efforts. My pleasure. I'm here to share information and to help you all achieve your driving goals by giving you free uh, advice and free tips. Um, void check, one, two, your test story reminded me a little about my test um, passed in Poland in September 2018. I was the last one to take a test that day. Then around other learners, I was calm. Uh, I started to feel nervous when I was left alone, but when the examiner said my name, I was calm and focused again. Kind of like me in my own driving instructor's exam, yeah. That's interesting there, Wojciech. Um, a couple more comments there, folks, and we're going to call it a night. Um, Eric Green, any advice for just getting a grade 2 in every section with no grade 3s? Do I just practice everything? It sounds like you're a bit rusty, Eric. It sounds like you're not a bad driver, but... You're, if you're getting grade twos over a wide area, it just feels that you you need a bit more work and you need a bit more practice and you may need a series of driving lessons to help get you on the right track. Uh, it does depend on what the grade twos are, but if you're not getting grade threes, that's a good sign and every time you drive, every time you set foot in the car, you're hopefully going to, to chisel down those grade twos and make them less and less. So a bit more practice, a bit more experience there is all I'd say you need. Thank you for all your guides and you're very welcome. Who's that? I am very welcome doing my test first week of January in the morning. Uh, so hopefully it's quiet and easier to drive. Keep up the amazing work. I certainly will. I am and good luck to you in your test. Hope it goes to plan for you. Aaron Bradshaw, you helped me pass my test two years ago. Thank you. And you're still here, Aaron. Good to have you. That's what I like to see. People still here after all these years. So well done to you, Aaron. I'm glad I was able to um, help you out. Grace Redmond, thank you. You're very welcome, Grace. Thanks for tuning in. Any questions, email me. Um, nice to have you. Andrew Kelly then, finally, I think. Cheers, Dane. Passed my test two weeks ago. Your videos helped loads. There's a nice comment to finish on. Thank you, Andrew. Glad I was able to help you. As I say, knowledge is power. I want to help all of you out there achieve your driving goals by giving you free advice and tips and free videos here on YouTube. So folks, briefly the signs again, number one, no entry, number two, hospital, number three, mini roundabout, number four, advanced yield sign, number five, um, pedestrian street, number six, dangerous bends, number seven, turn right, number eight, keep right, number nine, road narrows from the left, number 10, clearway, number 11, ramp ahead or, or humpback bridge, number 12, warning sign for some danger up ahead. If you do wish to make a voluntary donation by PayPal, you can. Links will be in the description to all my videos. If you've enjoyed this, don't forget to give it a like. Uh, that helps the YouTube algorithm and it helps me. It's a free way you can help me. Um, if you want to share your experience with me, <clears throat> you can email me. My email address is on screen there. Um, any advice, or any, if, you're looking, if you need any advice, if you have any questions, just let me know. Give me an email. I will get back to you. 
A um, couple more comments that are coming today. Let me see. Ke Ke uh, Kenny Agunbiare. Hi, then. Any advice for automatic car driving test? Yes. Um, you. I have a video on that. The driving an automatic is not that different to driving a manual. It should be easier because you have less work to do. Um, you still need to use the handbrake on the hill. Don't forget that. It's still good to use the handbrake at lights. If you want me to email email me and I'll give you some advice and I can send you my videos on automatic cars. I've only one actually anyway, so but I've the main points in that. And then finally, Janet Jinx, looking forward to the tips. Need as much as I can. Uh, I'm on my waiting list. And good luck to you, Janet Jinx, with your driving. Um, so you get professional driving lessons and you practice and you take one road at a time, you're going to have a great chance. Folks, I want to say a big thank you for any support out there, any donations, any likes, really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I hope you were able to get some help. I hope you found this live stream beneficial. And I'll be back soon with another video. Uh, I wish you all well. I wish you all a very, very happy new year and stay safe. I'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.